This is uh, from the book of Philippians, chapter 1. <clears throat> and Paul is speaking. Now I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel. I think the sisters are also included there. <clears throat> As a result, it has become clear throughout the whole uh, palace guard and to everyone else that I am in chains for Christ. Because of my chains, most of my brothers in the Lord have been encouraged to speak the word of God more courageously and fearlessly. It is true that some preach Christ out of envy and rivalry, but others out of goodwill. The latter do so in love, knowing that I am put here for the defense of the gospel. The former preach Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely supposing that they can stir up trouble for me while I am in chains. But what does it matter? The important thing is that in every way, whether from false motives or true, Christ is preached, and because of this, I rejoice. Yes, I will continue to rejoice, for I know that through your prayers and the help given by the Spirit of Jesus Christ, <clears throat> what has happened to me will turn out for my deliverance. I eagerly expect and hope that I will in no way be ashamed, but will have sufficient courage so that now, as always, Christ will be exalted in my body, whether by life or by death. For to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. If I am to go on living in the body, this will, remain, this will mean fruitful labor for me. Yet, what shall I choose? I do not know. I am torn between the two. I desire to depart and be with Christ, which is better by far. But it is more necessary for you that I remain in the body. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain, and I will continue with all of you for your progress and joy in the faith so that through my being with you again, your joy in Christ Jesus will overflow on account of me. Thank you, Pauline, and we thank God for his word. Carol, it's your time. <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> Let me pray for you, Carol. Heavenly Father, we want to thank you so much for Carol. Thank you for her willingness to spend her time with you exploring this passage. We thank you for the word that you have laid on her heart. By your spirit, would you speak through her into our lives. May we really hear what you would have us hear today. Bless her, Lord, as your word blesses us. In your name we ask this. Amen. Thank Amen. you, Carol. Thank you, Paul. Oops. Oops. Well, good morning, everyone. Another new year, although it feels a long time ago since the, the year turned. And what will this new year bring us, we wonder? We have learned that Omicron is more transmissible. Let our sharing of the good news be much more transmissible in 2022. We have just heard the passage on Philippians 1, 12 to 26. And the basic theme of this passage is that abundant life is found in Christ and we are called to work together to share this good news with people who don't know Jesus yet. So this talk divides into those two parts. Firstly, sharing the good news, and secondly, abundant life. Now, sharing the good news can often be easier said than done. We may have exhausted our supply of friends and family that we have shared the good news with, and yet they still don't respond. Or maybe one or two have done, but not the majority, and this can be disheartening. Paul understood what discouragement could feel like, 
but he didn't let it stop him sharing. We can share sensitively and with our lifestyle, both individually and as a church together. The good news we understand is, of course, the whole package from Jesus' miraculous birth, death, resurrection, ascension, and Pentecost, the power gifts of the Holy Spirit, including healing that confirms the gospel. It's why, as Christians, we offer to pray for people in all situations, including their healing. To emphasize the fruit of the Spirit and good works in our preaching is good, but we must always be looking to the Holy Spirit to use us in the power gifts. The early church was birthed in power and grew numerically through signs following, Mark 16, 20. Paul was writing from prison. Formerly, he had been under a kind of a house arrest, as we heard last week, for a couple of years, but now it was prison proper, as he awaited trial. His imprisonment could have been a cause for discouragement amongst the Philippian believers, but the opposite happened. And to quote the Oxford commentary, Paul does not explain how his imprisonment has encouraged Christians to proclaim their faith more boldly. Perhaps they are saying to themselves, if Paul can do so much in chains, how much more should we do in freedom? End of quote. Certainly we know from the scripture passage that the Roman guards and others knew why Paul was in prison, and it seemed to be causing a bit of a stir and talked about. It's really important to remember that Paul was not actively doing anything. He was in prison, restrained. He was talking. Was that all? That might be everything. Paul had, as we have, the Holy Spirit sustaining him in difficult circumstances. His words, his prayers seemed to be having an effect. Paul never stopped sharing the gospel. Paul, having planted the church at Philippi, had a Christian family of believers to support him with their prayers whilst he was in prison. And Paul was very thankful for that. We also have a family of believers to support us down the years, providing wisdom, encouragement, fellowship, help along the way. This circle of love and care is a reflection of the unity of the Godhead, the Trinity. It is together that our lives are lived out in Christ. We are built up and built together, both for our benefit and for the world to glimpse the unity of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit in our lives and in our endeavors. In verse 15, Paul writes in his letter that some are about preaching about Christ because they are jealous and envious of us. <clears throat> now, that is a strange thing to write. Paul clearly knew that those who were jealous and envious were not preaching from a pure place. They were not sincere. He states they just want to cause trouble for him whilst he's in there. He says it doesn't matter. Now, that's a big statement, of course, about where his heart is. For in the biblical world at that time, shaming or shame refers not to an emotion as we understand it, but to public discrediting the honor of a person. In the ancient world, and in mostly the Far East in our times, honor killings 
are because of discredit brought upon the whole family or village by someone's perceived wrong actions. It does, of course, still happen in our diverse Western world and here in Britain, sadly. So a public discrediting for Paul meant a discrediting of Jesus and especially its relevance for Paul's trial. But with confidence, Paul was able to say incredibly that it didn't matter. He was certain that the opportunity for the gospel to be shared will cause Christ to be exalted now as always in my body, whether by life or by death. Paul is going to speak the word boldly at his trial. They can do what they like to him because Christ's words, Christ's deeds will not return to him empty or void. Paul goes on to say that all that matters is that people are talking and telling about Christ. That makes Paul glad. While saying this, Paul then goes on to say that he wouldn't know what to choose, life or death. Life would mean that he would go on preaching and talking the gospel, but to die means to be with Christ, which would be much better. This isn't a death wish in the sense of someone losing all self-esteem, becoming terminally depressed and longing to get out of this life as quickly as possible. Paul is a man who loves Jesus. He could say that with certainty because he had been caught up to the third heaven, as we can read in 2 Corinthians 12, and saw unspeakable wonders there. Very hard for Paul to live in this world, having had the veil drawn back for him and deep experiences of the other world, which is only a whisper away. Paul saw this other world very clearly. It both transformed him and encouraged him to give his all for Jesus. But what Paul took from his original Damascus Road experience, this third heaven experience, and his ongoing walk with the Lord was revelatory and transformative. It transforms him as it transforms us from sinners to saved believers with the Holy Spirit continuing this transforming work. Paul was called for a very special purpose indeed. Most of us do not have that calling at all upon our lives here. We have not seen Christ in person as the apostles did or have a Damascus Road experience whereby an audible voice was heard. Some of you may have, I don't want to take away from that. Abundant life, could you pop in there? I want to encourage you. We have believed even though we haven't seen like Paul. Our faith, our ongoing faith and commitment is unbelievably precious in the sight of God. For he knows that we have not been given that level of insight that was given to Paul, yet we still continue steadfast in the faith. Paul finishes chapter one by exhorting the Philippians to live a life worthy of Christ, working harmoniously together in unity to spread the good news. This portion of scripture that we have been looking at shows Paul in great joy, confidence and serenity in difficult circumstances. He had come to this place of serenity through great trials in life. This shows us 
what the Lord wants for each one of us. Yes, we have each our allotted task in life, our life's work, our Christian work, our hard mountains to climb, and the green pastures of joy and delight as well along the way. It is truly by becoming disciples and not just believers that this can come to fruition in our lives. We have to learn often the very hard way how to constantly trust the Lord. If there's one thing to take from this half of the talk, it's about trust. That is how the abundant life is really experienced because it means we are dependent upon him. We truly recognize we cannot do it without dependence upon him. Faith is a gift. Trust is something that has to be put into action. We have to be proactive about it, really bring it up. It's so easy to go down the tubes of either anger, depression, or anxiety when faced with problems. Like Peter, we have to grab the Lord's hand when the waters would overwhelm us. Some of you probably read the book, The Shack, when it came out all those years ago, because it was very, very popular at that time. I know I did. I sort of liked it, but I was not happy with some of the theology in it. Anyway, Netflix has just released the film. Mike and I watched it. I think the film was made in 2017. It's still running at the moment if any of you want to watch it. The troubling bit of theology had been left out of the film, so I was quite pleased about that. <laughs> what was left was an emphasis on trust. That absolutely was the bottom line. For those, those of you who don't know the story and don't have Netflix, it's a Christian novel showing the Trinity as human beings living on earth at that moment for the benefit of a man called Mac. He had been abused as a boy, was a Christian, his daughter was kidnapped whilst they were on a family camping holiday and killed. In a myriad different ways, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit helped him, answering many of his questions, explaining that we will never always or often know the mystery or the reason why, but the better way is just to trust the Lord. We can only trust the Lord when we know him. We only know him because someone told us about him, invited us to church, and between all of the ministries, music, leading, preaching, fellowship, we committed our lives to him. What Mac and his family by extension received was release by forgiveness. Paul is very serene in this portion of scripture that we have been looking at. It's important to note from other scriptures that Paul has written that Paul did not always feel this way, as we don't either. Paul's feelings came and went, as ours do, but his belief, his trust, never wavered. It came through strengthened. To quote Tom Wright, learning to distinguish between the two and to maintain belief and hope with or without the accompanying feelings is itself part of Christian maturity. End of quote. <clears throat> Mike, my husband, had a very powerful word just before Christmas in our prayer time together. And it was one word release. It was for New Life Baptist Church. He believed that the Lord was calling each of us forward in 2022 to a place of release and greater trust, that together 
and individually he may use us as he chooses to use us, as we are released more. For some of us, like we saw in the passage, it may be to a greater level of boldness. I was challenged a few years ago at a conference told I had to be more bold. For others, it may be having to forgive the unforgivable. For others, sorry, to obtain that serenity that Paul had in this passage. For others, it may be more of a working together as we saw the Philippians doing in this passage. For others, it may be finally saying yes to God for something he has been impressing on us for a long, long time. And only all of you and us will know individually and corporately what that might be. Saying yes to God can involve sacrifice. It can sometimes be a hard road, but lessons are learnt the most in these times. And he is always there, always. Not testing us beyond our measure. And so often we are given joy and peace in exchange. We received a powerful email of confirmation of this word on Thursday of this week. Before I read the email out to you, I need to explain that several years ago, Mike was awoken in the middle of the night by the Lord, asking him to pray for the Jews and Messianic Jews, which he has faithfully done. As a church, we were invited by Westbridgeford Baptist Church the year before COVID, I think it was the year before or the year before that, to join them in a cedar meal. Some of us went, including Mike and I. The event was led by a messianic Jewish lady. Afterwards, Mike went up to her and told her he would pray for her and the work she was doing, and they have kept fleetingly in touch. This week, Mike really felt that this one word, release, was for her as well, and so he emailed it to her. I'm now going to read her email back to Mike. Dear Mike, you don't know how meaningful is this word you have sent me. And this year is the year of release, smita, in the Hebrew calendar. Thanks so much. May the Lord Jesus bless you. I am sending you our monthly prayer letter on the work in Budapest. Thanks for your prayers and encouragement. Blessings, Kata. In Leviticus, in the Old Testament, there was the seventh year of release from bondage, and every seven times seven years, i.e. every 49 years, rolling over into 50, was the year of Jubilee, which was a greater expression. This is the Hebrew year of release. Mike had no idea about this when he wrote to Cater. He has only ever prayed for her. He hasn't looked into all the Jewish Old Testament observances and and their calendars and what it means. The Lord is speaking powerfully to us as a church, both in David's word last week, exhorting us to stop paddling in the shallows and to go deeper. And now Mike's confirmed word of release. What would the Lord do with us if we surrender more? How more clearly could the Lord possibly speak to us than he has done with both David and Mike's words? And he's done that not to condemn us, but to give us himself so much more to bring others in for salvation, for healings, for miracles. Who doesn't want to live with greater joy and serenity 
in our lives as we trust him more, give ourselves more, as the transformation helps us to be more patient, more resilient. This is the great gift of grace and favour and power that the Lord wants to pour upon our lives. Actually, Paul has mentioned quite a bit of this just in his, and so has Rebecca. Yes, one day we will be in our eternal home, but how lovely to receive and understand more and more of heaven on earth now in this earthly life as we move closer to him. And I'll finish with a little poem that lots of you know. It's quite old. It's been around a long time, but it's worth repeating. Not till the loom is silent and the shuttles cease to fly will God unroll the canvas and explain the reason why. The dark threads are as needful in the weaver's skillful hands as the threads of gold and silver on the pattern he has planned. We are spiritual beings living in a spiritual world and we are also human beings living in our earthly world. It's a marriage made in heaven when we can draw from both worlds, fulfilling his loving and gentle purposes for our lives together. Amen. And I would just like us to spend a couple of moments in quiet now and allow the Lord to speak to you about anything that you might need release from or walking out of the shallows into something deeper. The first thing that may come into your mind can often be the right thing. Father God, we pray that you will move upon us individually and corporately into greater release and moving out of the shallows. That each person that has received something from you in understanding more of what has to be let go or embraced will be encouraged by your power and your strength to receive and sustain it. In the mighty name of Jesus, the name above all names, worshipped in heaven and on earth. Amen. <laughs>